So, first of all, thank you for thank you all for being here. Uh, today uh, we are here to present our our project Oceans We Are. <coughs> This, <laughs> this is a project that involves a large number of uh, researchers from CIMAR and um, today we will uh, share some of our main objectives and some of our first results because the, the project has started uh, around one year ago. So first of all, trying to put this. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it was not on. Okay. So my name is Ana Paula Musha and I'm here together with my my colleagues to to present uh, our project. We came from CIMAR that is a, a research uh, research center in the north of Portugal. It's a research center from the University of Porto and we work uh, in the frontier of uh, ocean knowledge and innovation. We are quite aligned with uh, SGD uh, uh, 14 and uh, also with, um, we, with the United Nations Decade for Ocean Science for sustain Sustainable Development and also we are aligned with the Decade for Ecosystem system restoration. So we work mainly in um, with focus on uh, on the ocean but also uh, focus on fresh water ecosystems. So um, the main objective of this of this project is to develop solutions that then that can contribute for the reduction of the anthropogenic impact in uh, in in our uh, oceans and, and uh, freshwater habitats and also to develop um, uh, solutions to, to, to re restore and uh, uh, recover uh, uh, in, uh, ecosystems impacted by, by human uh, pressure. So we, we are applying this, uh, main, uh, the main of our uh, our solutions locally in the in the north region of Portugal, but uh, the idea is that our technologies and our solutions can be applied uh, globally. The the project uh, was designed to 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 contribute to the the mission Starfish 2030 uh, from the European Union uh, and. Uh, uh, our main uh, objectives are aligned with the main objectives of the mission, so protection and restoration of um, marine and uh, freshwater habitats and biodiversity. Also, the, the prevention and elimination of, uh, uh, of uh, pollution, including chemical pollution, but also plastic pollution, and uh, uh, make the blue economy uh, carbon neutral and circular, uh, mainly with focus on aquaculture. Also, we are, we are aligned with the, the six uh, societal um, objectives of the decade for, for ocean science, uh, mainly the ones related with uh, clean ocean, healthy and resilient uh, oceans, and also the idea of have uh, um, sustainably uh, harvest oceans and uh, sustainable production of uh, uh, marine organisms for, for uh, uh, consumption. <coughs> Overall, we have a, like a transversal uh, objective of, uh, of contributing for a transparent ocean with uh, open access to, uh, access to data. And uh, <coughs> our main uh, research lines are uh, three. Uh, so the, the first research line is related with monitoring and the removal of uh, chemical and uh, plastic uh, pollution along the, the northwest Portuguese coast. The second one is the related to, to the recovery of degraded uh, habitats. And the third one is related with uh, the decarbonization 
of uh, uh, oceans and water with focus on aquaculture. Um, like a tr transversal objectives of this project is to respond to to these uh, main uh, enablers of the of the success of the um, of this project that are uh, open science uh, with uh, all the all the data that are being produced during this um, this project will be available in the open access model and also <coughs> to contribute to ocean literacy. Regarding uh, ocean literacy, <coughs> we have um, a group of uh, young researchers that are engaged in these uh, literacy, ocean literacy activities. They are uh, engaging uh, uh, several different uh, uh, groups of citizens, including schools, but also other uh, groups. Uh, engaging, uh, the, the idea is to connect and motivate uh, the citizens for, for to be implicated in this mission of uh, recovering uh, and uh, protect uh, uh, oceans and uh, freshwater habitats. And um, these groups of young researchers uh, have been developing uh, several activities that uh, aim to, to contribute for this ocean literacy. Some of them are here, so we have uh, Diogo and Lucia here. They, they are working with uh, sustainable aquaculture and they uh, are, uh, in parallel, they are contributing for this idea of, uh, of uh, uh, increase the, the, the acceptability of the aquaculture in the, in the population by producing face, Facebook posts. Also, we have here uh, Manuel that is uh, working with uh, the use of uh, new technologies to, to monitor inv invasive species and he's, uh, he's spreading his his project by by producing uh, videos to 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 be shared in in schools and uh, other uh, type of uh, activities like uh, info, infographics and uh, didactic booklets are being produced in this uh, project. Um, now we we I will uh, pass the the word to my colleagues. Uh, uh, so the. Maris Almeida, Marina Dolbet and Rui Magalhães will present the three uh, main research lines of this project. Uh, we will start with research line one, so removing and monitoring chemical and um, plastic contamination. And uh, Marisa, uh, the floor is yours. So thank you very much and good afternoon everybody. Thank you for coming. So I'll be presenting uh, the first line. And basically, this is moving too fast, sorry. <laughs> uh, so basically, uh, what are we doing in this line? So we want to move on to towards zero pollution. First of all, we need to monitor, we need to see what is there, and we need to assess uh, toxic effects, ecological impacts. And so one part of this line is in fact monitoring, assessing the risk, assessing evaluate, uh, and evaluating ecological and toxicological impacts. And then we uh, have another part of this line, which is the, the recovery of this. So pr proposing solutions that could uh, recover these environments, remove these pollutants that are already there, prevent them from getting there, and proposing all these solutions. We are using as model, as Ana Paula said, so the, the northwest coast of Portugal. And we are using one story for, for the recovery and the monitoring mostly, uh, one, two of the north estuaries. And so I will start with some results and some goals that we have uh, on some of, this, uh, of these, uh, these lines that I've been discussing. So starting with monitoring, we've been monitoring a lot of chemical pollutants, but we are also monitoring plastics, namely microplastics, as we all know it's one of our uh, main problems nowadays and it's one of the main problems of our ocean and so we are assessing microplastic contamination and we are using these stuarine areas as models 
because they are extremely important between the, the interface with rivers, coastal, land, terrestrial um, ecosystems and the ocean and that they are also sources of uh, a lot of um, of pollutants and also a lot of uh, they are sinks of these these pollutants because they come from different uh, origins including from the rivers and they can be seen in these uh, ecosystems so we are assessing the contamination and we are evaluating its impacts uh, using larva fish using zooplankton using phytoplankton using um, also the potential of ingestion of these uh, uh, particles and also to, have to see how this is affecting the dynamics of these communities in the Slovenia. So basically uh, we are collecting um, larva fish and microplastics in two Sturin areas. We had a previous study in the Doro Sturin area where we seen that we had more microplastics than fish larva. So we want to confirm this and uh, we are using two estuaries in the north of Portugal to assess this contamination and then we want also to evaluate this ecological uh, impact. We are also linking this to other activities that are present in serene areas, namely uh, aquaculture activities. So we have, for instance, oyster culture activities in here and we want to understand are we having microplastics in these areas, are they affecting the organisms being produced and we want to understand how they are responding to, to this. So we are basically also quantifying microplastics in oysters um, produced in the Lima River Estuary. Uh, another point that we are um, also monitoring is the microplastics not only in the water of the the, the, the storine areas, but also on the salt marshes. So uh, we are using this um, Lima River estuary because it has a very um, good uh, salt marsh area, very big, very productive, uh, very interactive, so it's spread all over the estuary. And so we are monitoring not only the water, but also what's buried in the sediments. And we want to check if the vegetated parts of this estuary, so the salt marshes, are impacting, are releasing, are producing, are acting, acting are the plants, they are doing something uh, about it. And we are trying to use this knowledge to go forward in the remediation uh, measures. So basically we are monitoring, um, besides the, the, the plastics as I said, we are also monitoring other pollutants like pharmaceutical compounds, metals, we are trying to monitor a wide range of chemical contaminants and see the interactions. And then we are proposing um, wetlands for their recovery. And we are tackling two types of wetlands. One, natural wetlands, so this salt marsh that I just mentioned. And uh, another one is constructed wetlands. So basically, uh, wetlands include a wide variety of uh, ecosystems and they are extremely important um, globally. And so they have been long used as discharge of pollutants sites because uh, they can really improve water quality. And so what we want to see is to further explore this, this process, understand this process and promote this process and use them in our favor to remove all of these pollutants that we are detecting and promoting ways to recover these environments. And uh, constructed wetlands is basically as the name says. So it's a wetland based on everything that we know about wetlands, but it's a constructed system. It's an engineering system that we can construct to clean up waters. And this can be used to clean up waters from different sources. We can use it for wastewater, we can use it for stream waters that are contaminated. So basically the idea is to understand, we know the process that occur in natural wetlands, so we translate them into these constructed wetlands and we optimize these procedures. In order to what? In order to promote um, the retention and prevent that pollutants reach our ecosystems, namely our serene areas. So basically, regarding the natural wetlands, we are using Lima River as a model. We are monitoring all of these pollutants, so not only the microplastics, but the pharmaceuticals, the metals. We are assessing them in the waters, we are assessing them in sediments, and, um, and this is the first results we have regarding metals. 
So what we've seen is that these vegetated areas and the plants are capable of retaining the metals that are in the water, that are spread around this system. So if we have a source of metals coming down the river, they will be trapped in these sediments and then the plants will contribute for their removal. Preventing them from being spread in the system, preventing them from uh, having greater impacts namely on fish and to reach, not reaching the ocean. So, uh, as I said, we are also working not only with natural, but with constructed wetlands. Constructed wetlands are known for 50 years or something, but they are still used a lot like a black box. So basically you put water contaminated and you take water out decontaminated. But in order to really use this, we need to understand what's inside that box. And what we are doing is uh, not only uh, trying to understand how the pollutants get retained and get eliminated in there, but the key parameters that are there. So we have absorption properties about the sediment and the soil and the substrate, and we have all the microbial community that is acting there and it's actively degrading organic contaminants and then we have the plants promoting the microbial communities. So what we are doing, we are understanding this process in order to increase this process, in order to make them more efficient, more fast and in fact with all this knowledge we are promoting a biotechnological tools based on microbial consortiums that we can use that we can add to these natural wetlands or to these constructed wetlands in order to remove these pollutants. So basically, we want to prevent them from reaching our natural areas. If they reach, we want to promote the presence of vegetation, we want to promote the presence of plants, we want a healthy microbial environment in order for these pollutants to be retained there, to be eliminated, and then recover the areas that we have. And thank you. Thank you very much, Marisa. And now I will give the floor to Marina Dalbert. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about the possible uh, regeneration of degraded marine habitats. And this line is pretty much aligned with the previous line. You already seen some options for regenerating these, these degraded habitats, and I'm going to show you some more. <clears throat> Okay, so first of all, let's look, about, let's look on the pathways to recover from a degraded ecosystem. And this can be as simple as removing the source of stress. The whole idea when we want to recover the system is that we have a degraded system that we want to, to become, that we want that system to get back to its original state. So this can be as simple as removing the stresses, but it's rarely that simple. And sometimes uh, we have stressors that is not that easy to remove. Other times our systems may undergo such change that we uh, undergo under this regime shift and we end up with a very degraded ecosystem and we cannot recover it without an active, uh, active actions from our side and restoration can definitely be a source for it, okay, a solution. So, um, and even in this idea, even if we do implement these actions, we may not end up to the original state in that system. We may end up with something a bit different. Our system may be recovered, but has no longer the same functioning that it has, to, it has before, or the same species, or the same habitats. So we may end up with something different, okay? Um, and you probably already heard about this, nature-based solutions. What could be the possible way to recover our ecosystems? We can impl impl implement what we call nature-based solutions. And I include here some of the, um, the definitions. And you can see, basically, it's actions to protect, sustainable manage, restore uh, natural and modified ecosystems. Or we can also define them as solutions inspired by nature, so basically, we want nature to work and do her thing in order to restore our systems. But the common thing about this is that we want, um, we want to get back and we want to promote biodiversity. And this biodiversity is the natural capital for all the ecosystem services that underpin our human well-being, okay, underpin our, our well-being. So the idea of using these nature-based solutions is that we can 
at the same time promote biodiversity and also promote a range of ecosystem services that are so important for us. And what could be ideal nature-based solutions? I include here three examples, and there are more, but I include these three examples because we are working more with these three examples in this, in this project. Marine forests, seagrass meadows, and salt marshes. You already heard about the salt marshes in, with Marie's presentation. And we are going to uh, focus a little bit more on the marine forests and the seagrass meadows. And why are these so important? They are habitat farming species. And this means that they provide habitat for a wide range uh, of marine life. Okay, so they, they have uh, a three-dimensional structure that actually provides habitat and nursery areas, refugees from predators, feeding grounds, including for endemic species and also commercial species. So they are fomenting also fisheries uh, from different sources. Uh, and besides that, they have a whole wider range of ecosystem services associated. One of that everyone is talking about is the blue carbon potential. So they can contribute for climate regulation. We are still trying to understand uh, how, in trying to quantify this, but for sure these sort of marine habitat sp species have a higher efficiency in sequestering carbon than, for instance, the terrestrial systems. Also, coastal protection. Improve water quality. We have heard about the remediation potential of some of these species, but they can also remove the excess of nutrients. Rural growth opportunities. They represent food, but they also represent other things. They represent biocompounds uh, source for uh, pharmaceutical industry, for cosmetics, for several applications. Um, and uh, again, and it's also very important, they also can represent uh, a really important asset in terms of tourism and in terms of the cultural heritage. And this is very clear in the north of Portugal. We still have, I included you on one picture, because we still have, this is a, an old tradition of getting the rack of the algae, and this also uh, used to occur in the center there, of getting the rack of the, the seagrass in order to fertilize fields. So we see that these are really, really important. And habitat farming species will provide us with the biodiversity benefits and also with the ecosystem benefits that are so important. And by these, we can ideally saw them as ideally nature-based solutions for a variety uh, of impacts. So let's, let's put this scheme again and try to put some practical example on this. So what could be... Um, what could be uh, a healthy marine forest with all those benefits that I just talked uh, can be impacted by several, um, several stressors. And I include some of those. I include more global ones like climate change, uh, eutrophication, and also harvesting. And we may end up with something uh, that is no longer able to provide all the services that we need. Um, like these turf systems. Uh, we, and this is actually happening nowadays. We are seeing that a lot of these marine forests are declining and are being replaced by these turf systems. A viable solution for this, first of all, we need to conserve them, the ones that exist. And then we could do also active restoration in order to try to get something similar of what we had. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this, um, uh, but these are some of the examples of the um, of, of what CIMAN is doing also in the scope of ocean reserves and also with other projects of testing some methods in order to restore so, so that we have again a healthy ecosystem, a healthy marine forest and have all the benefits that are associated to that. And now let's see uh, a seagrass example and this is something that we are working on now at this moment and I would like to guide you through on a pilot restoration program that we have been implementing. Um, and basically, let me explain you a little bit more. So this, this pilot restoration pl uh, pi uh, uh, pl uh, program was implemented with a very clear goal. This was done in Rio da Feira, and we wanted to rehabilitate the system uh, from historical contamination. This, this program in particular was done uh, in cooperation with, uh, with other teams from, uh, from the University of Aveiro. So basically, we had to go, we, we went to a source donor area, which is this one over here at the at, up, and uh, we, um, we collected some samples 
And we did this mosaic. Uh, we transplanted them into the area of intervention where we wanted, where we wanted to rehabilitate from the coastal, uh, from the historical contamination. And I want to guide you through th this process. Okay, so let us see. So this was in November, okay, uh, 2019. Let's see what happened. This is about 20 square meter. January, still okay. March, uh, more or less okay, but it's winter time, so it might not grow uh, as we expect. This is a plant, okay? And we even put some protection over there in order to protect our, our transplant experiment. June. You remember what happened. We had the pandemics. We were not able to go to the, f to the field. And then when we went, we had nothing. Okay? So what, what did we did? We went back again. And we did it again. We learned from our mistakes from the past. And we, we can discuss that afterwards. But we went again. We did a new transplant experiment. July, October, look how it is. February, it looks much better, right? So we can see that it's expanding. And over here, I'm going here, sorry. But over here, this was an original path, OK? So we know that Sostera was there. You know that the seagrass was there before. And June 2021, September, we then decided, this was so healthy that we then decided to link both areas. September, October, here we are working there. March 2022 and May, and we are going there next week to see how it is. Now, this was really exciting. We are being able to actually implementing and restoring this habitat in the system. But let's see what it represents, because now it's not just restoring the habitat. We want to be sure, um, and this is what we are working on Ocean Trezer, and I still don't have all results, I'm just going to um, uh, explain a little bit what we have, the preliminary results, because the whole idea is that, okay, we have our origi original state, this is the, our source donor area, the highly degraded, and then the restorage process in order to have something like this. But what does it represent? Are we being able to restore the functions and are we being able to restore the services? Well, first of all, and I just put here some, some preliminary results, and we know that the path and the timing of the recovery is really difficult to predict. But after one year, we saw that in terms of the contaminant availability, we, uh, the transplant was actually doing something because we saw that uh, the places with no vegetation had higher uh, concentration of the contaminant. And, and when we impl implemented the transplant, the, it was really similar to what we had uh, on our source. And then this is something that we are actually looking for. We want to understand whether the local biodiversity is actually being uh, augmented, if we have uh, productivity also being augmented. And our first results are showing that, yes, at least biomass is increasing. We are still doing these uh, calculations. But yes, we suspect, yes, we will have a higher productivity. We are having trophic chains with higher complexity, OK, because we have an additional resource there. So this means that we are stimulating uh, everything through the trophic chain. And this may imply more resources for fish. Uh, so whether if we are promoting or not the nursery function, it's more difficult to assess. But this is something that we, we want with this, with this program. And think about if this would, would have been done at a larger scale. We would also be contributing with some blue carbon potential. Okay. Not at this scale, but at this scale, it can contribute something, but at a larger scale, it could really contribute something. OK, so overall, and I'm about to finish, um, this looks simple, this restoration pilot. Well, because I've guided you through uh, this process, it looks simple, but it's not as simple, and it can be really, really challenging. So it's really important that we have clear goals. It's really important, and for this particular case, I'm going to talk about this, the seagrass, but this also applies for other systems. It's really important that you know um, the status of, of what you want to restore, the seagrass status. What are the causes, for instance, in this case, for the, for the seagrass decline? The stressor status and effects. To model the best location, this was not arbitrary. So we didn't define that location just because we thought, um, okay, let's put it here. 
first of all, we wanted to remediate uh, the contamination. But even in that area, we had to do some modeling in order to understand in terms of the currents, um, in terms of the whole dynamics of the system, that that location would be, imp uh, would be relevant and would be success successful. The viable source material for the restoration, this is really important. In this case, we only use material from Maria, but if we think about other options and if we think about remediating from climate change, we may need to consider other options and need to consider, for instance, the genetic potential of, uh, of the species in, in which are the ones more resilient and more resistant to our stressors. Deal with failure. We had a failure and we had to deal with it. And also, we still have some unpredictability in the outputs. And of course, consider climate change. So uh, this is all to show that it's really important that you have knowledge-informed decisions. And if you go for larger scale, of course, involve the local community. But the overall message, yes, we can regenerate our ecosystems and in this way also promote biodiversity and, bi and ecosystem services. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Marina. Now we'll follow for the, the third um, research line of this project, decarbonizing our water and oceans. And uh, Rui Magalhães will show us uh, how aquaculture can be a part of the solution. So. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, and thank you for your presence here. And today, as was said, I will present you uh, the research line three of the Ocean 3R project, which is related with the discarbonization of our waters and oceans. And I will present my person, personal view uh, of uh, how aquaculture can be a part of this uh, solution also. So in this research line, we have several tasks. So we start to formulate more eco-friendly diets and uh, for that we use uh, some local uh, uh, agro-industrial byproducts and uh, we had also some functional addictives uh, to uh, turn these aquafits uh, more uh, uh, with a, a more sustainable uh, approach of these of these diets so uh, after that we test uh, those diets uh, in, in fish and see how fish fed with these diets cope with climate changes. Uh, furthermore, uh, we also want to sensibilize the general public to eat more fish because as we'll see, fish production is more sustainable than other animal production uh, industries. Uh, furthermore, we all want to also uh, clean up our ocean uh, by kelp reforestation, but also promoting more sustainable ways to produce seafood. Uh, and finally, uh, our colleagues are working uh, in several ways to harvest marine renewable energy. And finally, as was presented before, we want to uh, bring bringing the gaps uh, together between the research and also the public. public uh, so, uh, and we want to sensibilize people to the problem of the, the discarbonization of fish industry. So, as I said before, we need to formulate more sustainable diets, so we start working with local byproducts, uh, mainly from the wine and olive oil industry, but we also add to our aquafits functional ingredients to reduce the carbon footprint of these aquafits, so we want to uh, substitute uh, traditional ingredients like soybean meal that is grown all over the world and substitute this soybean meal for, uh, by uh, local ingredients that are uh, produced uh, in our country. So uh, we want to in also increase the nutritional value of uh, uh, that ingredients. Uh, so we are using fermentation process uh, to produce uh, these ingredients with a uh, higher nutritional value. Uh, we are also using short and medium chain fatty acids as a functional additives uh, to improve the, this aquafit utilization by fish. Of course, all of this is to reduce the nitrogen, phosphorus and carbon uh, the budget of uh, these aquafits. So, as I said before, uh, we are testing agro-industrial byproducts mainly from the wine and olive oil uh, industry, but we are also testing uh, some local ingredients like macroalgae, uh, and we are trying to increase their nutritional value 
uh, by, uh, by ma uh, making uh, some fermentations with selected fungus and the fermented biomass is included in experimental diets that are being tested in fish growth trial trials to assess growth performance and also feed utilization by the fish. But I want to show you that aquaculture is already a, a very sustainable way to produce animal protein. As we can see, uh, fish production uh, produce less nitrogen and phosphorus when compared with beef and pork production and it's only comparable with poultry. But if we are talking about uh, bivalves, bivalves extract uh, nitrogen and phosphorus so they are cleaning the environment where they are being grown. So the second uh, step was to study how these uh, eco-friendly eco -friendly diets impact the, the, the ability of fish to cope with climate changes. So to do that we uh, uh, assess uh, this effect with temperature and salinity challenge trials and uh, in, that, in, that, in, those, uh, uh, in those trials we quantify energy budget, oxygen consumption and also the metabolic rates of this fish compared with fish fed traditional uh, aquafits. So we also want to the public eat more fish so we are ensuring the food uh, sanitary quality of the, the seafood that we are producing so we are monitoring the prevalence of parasites in different species like gilted sea rim and also European sea bass. We are also ensuring the, fresh, uh, uh, the freshness of this, uh, this seafood uh, throughout the shelf life uh, effects of uh, bioproservatives. So we are testing new coating extracts to increase this nutritional value uh, of the fish uh, fillet for human consumption, mainly uh, related with lipid peroxidation. But I, I, I want also to show you that producing fish is more sustainable uh, once again than produce uh, poultry and beef uh, and even uh, is more sustainable than produce uh, the chicken. Uh, as we can see we only need 1.1 1 .1, uh, uh, kilograms of aquafits to produce 1 kilogram of uh, salmon and of course the carbon footprint and water consumption is less significant. Uh, when compared with other industries of animal production. So the other task is clean up the ocean. So we, are, we have uh, colleagues that are working with kelp reforestation. They are evaluate the efficiency of different string materials and rock types as a substrate for this reforestation. And we also want to uh, uh, improve uh, the public awareness about AMTA, the public, and also uh, the uh, private initiative. So we want to establish the most prof profitable AMTA system and also test its bioremediation capacity. So what is AMTA? AMTA is a, a sustainable way to produce seafood with high commercial value. Uh, so in the same sister system, we combine organisms from different trophic levels uh, where the unneeded feed and waste of one species is recaptured and uh, converted into feed or fertilizer uh, to another species, uh, generally species with lower trophic level. So I bring a practical example of this. Let me say that we have a commercial, a commercial unit uh, that uh, is producing uh, European sea bass. The fish need to be fed, so the unneeded uh, feed and feces uh, will serve as a food for sea urchins and oysters and the dissolved inorganic uh, waste will serve as a fertilizer for uh, carbon sink species like seaweeds and allophytic plants like salicornia. So the commercial unit uh, is able to produce five different species and produce a, a effluent uh, much more uh, clean. Of course, MTA has several benefits. Uh, we produce different species with less water we have nutrient recirculation within the system and this will lead to lower environmental impact and of course an economic diversification for the commercial company. But uh, the species selection is not simple because the species need to be native and well adapted to the physical chemical uh, parameters of that site. Uh, they need to be integrated in the trophic web, uh, increase the product system uh, efficiency and also the water quality they need to present high growth rate and market attractiveness and high economical value uh, to be uh, interesting for the producer.
And this is a perfect example of a, an MTA in a commercial scale. Uh, here we have a floating cage that is producing salmon. Salmon is fed, the unneeded feed and feces will serve as a food for sea cucumbers, uh, mussels and clams that are being grown nearby and the dissolved in organic matter uh, uh, is uh, utilized as a fertilizer uh, for carbon sink species like macroalgae. And finally, we have some colleagues that are working with the possibility to produce marine renewable energy. So they want to extract energy uh, from wind, tidal and also uh, waves. So they are, uh, they are studying where uh, are the best places uh, to invest in some uh, already existing uh, aquaculture facilities to apply uh, this new technology to harvest renewable energy and to substitute the traditional ways to produce uh, energy. The, and the producers are mainly use uh, electric generation that, that uh, generators that uh, function by oil. So we are trying to substitute this unsustainable way to produce energy by uh, more sustainable approaches. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Rui. Now um, you can find some more uh, information about our project in our website and also about the, the dissemination activities that are going on, our uh, scientific uh, uh, outputs. But now I, we, we can open for a discussion if uh, you have some questions to, to, to put. And uh, I don't know if someone wants to ask uh, a question. Otherwise, we will be here and we can talk together about uh, our project with you. OK. Do you have a question? Hello. Thank you. So um, I, I would like to, to, to know, I have this curiosity, how would you interconnect or correlate these uh, research lines together? What, what is your approach? Okay, the, thank you very much for the question. The, um, the research lines are really connected because, uh, as, as, for example, the, the, um, the removal of contaminants is also uh, uh, important in terms of uh, uh, ecosystem regeneration and salt marshes that uh, that can be used for for um, for pollutant uh, uh, extractions and removal are also uh, important uh, ecosystems that need to be regenerated and if they are regenerated we increase we decrease the 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 amount of uh, contaminants that came into rivers and estuaries and also this this idea of uh, of using uh, aquaculture and uh, uh, for example these uh, multi-trophic integrated uh, um, systems are really connected with the idea of uh, uh, recovering the ecosystem and and uh, decrease the, the impact, the environmental impact of the aquaculture, removing nutrients, that al it's also important in terms of, of uh, pollution, zero pollution. So uh, all the, the research lines are really connected. Uh, and uh, apart from this connection between the, the research line, uh, for us it's also very important to have this transversal um, communication activities that uh, bring all, all these these subjects into the general public and uh, uh, to bring the citizens to 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 contribute and to to be uh, engaged in this idea of uh, decreasing pollution, uh, recovering ecosystems, and uh, production producing uh, food in the less. Uh, with less impact for, for the environment. Thank you all for the presentations. They're super interesting. I just have a question for Marina, maybe. Um, I was wondering how scalable the, the restoration efforts for the salt marshes versus the kelp forest are. At which scale can 
this goal potentially? And whether do you think that by having um, really effective restoration methodologies can be perceived by some stakeholders as a way to um, sort of not thinking so much about the threats anymore? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, um, about the scale of it, this is something that we definitely have to study. It, the, the, I mean, what I presented was a pilot, and this is really important for us to do a pilot in order to understand if this, if it is possible, uh, to scale up to to a dimension where it really will matter in a meaningful, very meaningful way. Um, do you want to add something? No, no, go. Uh, and related to that scale, I was wondering if you have assessed, for instance, the cost of restoration. Yeah, that's a really important question that in this particular case we have not assessed because we had a very clear goal. But of course, if, if we went, and this is in terms of costs, this is not, I mean, the, what we tried here, it's not uh, that costy, but if we want to implement it to a larger scale, and that's why I, I was telling that we need to involve the local community as well, first, to un for them to understand what are the implications of this and why are we doing this in the first place, because we should have conserved it in, in the first place. And sometimes we may use restoration in order to have other services that we, or in order to promote other solutions uh, for, for instance, mining climate change. Um, but. Yeah, you're right, we didn't assess, we didn't quantify that cost, and this is really an important issue if you want to do it for a larger scale implementation. But the pilot is to assure that things will work on, and then after that we can do something else and trying to see how, how, it, how it, will, um, it will be. Regarding the marine forests, I'm not the best person to tell you actually, but we are testing different methods because the methods are still not, um, uh, in terms of uh, if, uh, efficiency, uh, we are st still trying to see how it works. Um, but again, in the cost, I'm just, I'm just thinking again, we always have to think what are we trying to achieve? And here we are trying to achieve uh, more biodiversity, we are trying to achieve ecosystem services, we are trying to, and everything has to be put in a waiter. And to see, uh, I mean, this is definitely, in my point of view, it's definitely something that we need to uh, game on, game on. And what's the cost of not doing this? Yeah, and what's the that's cost the of not doing thing. it? Yeah. But it, it, that's linked to your second uh, question that is quite relevant, that is, uh, sometimes this can be see okay we, we, we don't need to, to, to protect care anymore. because then we, we can regenerate it will always be much more uh, expensive expensive not yeah. only in terms of financial but uh, yeah. environmental costs to to restore than to protect yeah. but of course if it distract we, we should restore yeah but yes of course we should first the first line first is to know what exists and to know the potential and conserve uh, and protect what we have and then at another scale another another stage because this of course implies costs and much higher costs than conserving what we have then we can think about this thank you and the same for, for example, for this kind of uh, aquaculture uh, integrated systems. Uh, eventually, it's not uh, so financially. You, you will not have at uh, maybe a, at a shorter time not not so so many uh, profits, but uh, at long time. And if you take in, uh, into account the environmental impacts of, of this activity it will be a benefit, so. If we don't have much more, uh, any more questions, we will close and thank you very much for being here with us. And uh, con please continue to follow us in our websites and thank you very much.